growing banana. Hey Martin, how are you going with your Australian Studies tutorial paper? Oh, good. I finished it actually. Lucky you. What did you do it on? I'm still trying to find an interesting topic. Well, after some consideration, I decided to look at the history of banana growing in Australia. Banana growing? Yeah, banana growing. Fascinating, I'm sure. Well, it's not as boring as you'd think. And I wanted to tie it into the work I've been doing on primary industries and the economy. Anyway, I bet there are a few things you didn't know about bananas. Such as? Such as the fact that bananas were among the first plants ever to be domesticated. Oh, really? Yeah, they're an extremely nourishing food. I suppose you're going to tell me the whole history of banana growing now, aren't you? <laughs> well, it'll be a good practice round for my tutorial next week. I'll do the same for you sometime. OK, fire away. So where were these bananas first domesticated? According to my research, the Cavendish banana, which is a, a type of banana and the first type to be cultivated here, actually originated in China, but they had a fairly roundabout route before they got to Australia. You mean they didn't go straight from China to Australia? No, they didn't. It seems that in 1826, bananas were taken from South China to England. I suppose they'd have made a welcome addition to the English diet. Yes, I'm sure. Well, apparently there was an English duke who was particularly fond of bananas, and he used to cultivate them in his hothouse, which is where you have to grow them in England, of course, because of the cool climate. And they became quite popular in the UK. So he was the one responsible for cultivating the Cavendish banana, which was then introduced into Australia. I see. And we've been growing them ever since. Yeah. Are they hard to grow? Well, yes and no. To grow them in your garden, no, not really. But to grow them commercially, you need to know what you're doing. You see, you only get one bunch of bananas per tree, and it can take up to three years for a tree to bear fruit if you don't do anything special to it. But this period is greatly reduced with modern growing methods, particularly in plantations where you have perfect tropical conditions. Right. So what are you looking at? One year? Two years? No, no, around 15 months in good conditions for a tree to produce a, a bunch of bananas. And once you've got your bunch, you cut the bunch and the plant down. So how do the trees reproduce then? Well, bananas are normally grown from suckers, which spring up around the parent plant, usually just above the plant. They tend to like to grow uphill, or at least that's the common wisdom. So that's why banana plantations are usually on hillsides, is it? Yeah, they grow best like that. That's interesting. If you plant them in rich soil and give them plenty of water at the beginning of summer, then they should be well advanced by the beginning of winter, when growth virtually stops. But in a country like England, they're hard to grow. Although, you can grow them in a hothouse. But in Australia, it's not difficult. No. Though even here, the growers put plastic bags around the bunches to protect them and keep them warm. If you go up to the banana growing districts, you'll see all these banana trees with plastic bags on them. But how do they stop the bananas going bad before they reach the shops? Well, the banana bunches are picked well before the fruit's ripe. Once you cut the bunch, the bananas stop growing, but they, they do continue to ripen. The interesting thing is that once one banana ripens, it gives off a gas which then helps all the others to ripen. So they pretty much all ripen within a few hours of each other. Amazing. So do we export lots of bananas overseas to Europe and Asia, for instance? Well, oddly enough, no. I believe New Zealand takes a small proportion of the crop, but otherwise well, they're mostly grown for the domestic market. Which is surprising when you think about it, because we grow an enormous number of bananas each year. Yes, well, thank you for all that information. I'm sure the tutorial paper will go really well. You certainly seem to have done your research on the subject. Let's hope so. The Spirit Bear Today, we continue our series on ecology and conservation with a look at a particularly endangered member of the black bear family. One in ten black bears is actually born with a white coat, which is the result of a special gene that surfaces in a few. Local people have named it the spirit bear, and according to the legends of these communities, its snowy fur brings with it a special power. Because of this, it has always been highly regarded by them so much that they do not speak of seeing it to anyone else. It is their way of protecting it when strangers visit the area. 
The white bear's habitat is quite interesting. The bear's strong relationship with the old-growth rainforest is a complex one. The white bear relies on the huge, centuries-old trees in the forest in many ways. For example, the old-growth trees have extremely long roots that help prevent erosion of the soil along the banks of the many fish streams. Keeping these banks intact is important because these streams are home to salmon, which are the bear's main food source. In return, the bear's feeding habits nurture the forest. As the bears eat the salmon, they discard the skin and bones in great amounts on the forest floor, which provide vital nutrients. These produce lush vegetation that sustains thousands of other types of life forms, from birds to insects and more. Today, the spirit bear lives off the coast of the province of British Columbia on a few islands. There is great concern for their survival, since it is estimated that less than 200 of these white bears remain. The best way to protect them is to make every effort to preserve the delicate balance of their forest environment. In other words, their ecosystem. The greatest threat to the bear's existence is the loss of its habitat. Over many years, logging companies have stripped the land by cutting down a large number of trees. In addition, they have built roads which have fractured the areas where the bear usually feeds, and many hibernation sites have also been lost. The logging of the trees along the streams has damaged the places where the bears fish. To make matters worse, the number of salmon in those streams is declining because there is no legal limit on fishing at the moment. All these influences have a negative impact on the spirit bear's very existence, which is made all the more fragile by the fact that reproduction among these bears has always been disappointingly low. And so, what's the situation going forward? Community organizations, environmental groups, and the British Columbia government are now working together on the problem. The government is now requiring logging companies to adopt a better logging method, which is a positive step. However, these measures alone may not be sufficient to ensure a healthy population of the spirit bear in the future. Other steps also need to be taken. While it is important to maintain the spirit bear's habitat, there also needs to be more emphasis on its expansion. The move is justified as it will also create space for other bears that are losing their homes to... Fiddy Working Heritage Farm Welcome to the Fiddy Working Heritage Farm. This open-air museum gives you the experience of agriculture and rural life in the English countryside at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see a typical farm of that period, and like me, all the staff are dressed in clothes of that time. I must give you some advice and safety tips before we go any further. As it's a working farm, please don't frighten or injure the animals. We have a lot here, and many of them are breeds that are now quite rare. And do stay at a safe distance from the tools. Some of them have sharp points, which can be pretty dangerous, so please don't touch them. We don't want any accidents, do we? The ground is very uneven and you might slip if you're wearing sandals, so I'm glad to see you're all wearing shoes. We always advise people to do that. Now, children of all ages are very welcome here, and usually even very young children love the ducks and lambs, so do bring them along next time you come. I don't think any of you have brought dogs with you, 
but in case you have, I'm afraid they'll have to stay in the car park unless they're guide dogs. I'm sure you'll understand that they could cause a lot of problems on a farm. Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right. And we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland. And of course, the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops. But our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small, so you can't get lost in it. Now, can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafes on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right, here, just by the new barn, you'll come to the Black Barn, just where the path first bends. Now, I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard, just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right, well if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. The Tawny Owl Good evening everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the Tawny Owl, because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes, the tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland 
on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, the owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet. Woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones, such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanised landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds. So there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximise their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometres. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the... The use of soil to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We saw in the last lecture, a major cause of climate change is the rapid rise in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last century. If we could reduce the amount of CO2, perhaps the rate of climate change could also be slowed down. One potential method involves enhancing the role of the soil that plants grow in with regard to absorbing CO2. Ratan Lau, a soil scientist from Ohio State University in the USA, claims that the world's agricultural soils could potentially absorb 13% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the equivalent of the amount released in the last 30 years, and research is going on into how this might be achieved. Lau first came to the idea that soil might be valuable in this way, not through an interest in climate change, but rather out of concern for the land itself and the people dependent on it. Carbon-rich soil is dark, crumbly and fertile and retains some water. But erosion can occur if soil is dry, which is a likely effect if it contains inadequate amounts of carbon. Erosion is of course bad for people trying to grow crops or breed animals on that terrain. In the 1970s and 80s, Lau was studying soils in Africa so devoid of organic matter that the ground had become extremely hard, like cement. There he met a pioneer in the study of global warming, who suggested that carbon from the soil had moved into the atmosphere. This is now looking increasingly likely. Let me explain. For millions of years, Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been regulated, in part, by a natural partnership between plants and microbes, tiny organisms in the soil. Plants absorb CO2 from the air and transform it into sugars and other carbon-based substances. While a proportion of these carbon products remain in the plant, some transfer from the roots to fungi and soil microbes, which store the carbon in the soil. The invention of agriculture some 10,000 years ago 
disrupted these ancient soil building processes and led to the loss of carbon from the soil. When humans started draining the natural topsoil and ploughing it up for planting, they exposed the buried carbon to oxygen. This created carbon dioxide and released it into the air. And in some places, grazing by domesticated animals has removed all vegetation, releasing carbon into the air. Tons of carbon have been stripped from the world's soils, where it's needed, and pumped into the atmosphere. So, what can be done? Researchers are now coming up with evidence that even modest changes to farming can significantly help to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Some growers have already started using an approach known as regenerative agriculture. This aims to boost the fertility of soil and keep it moist through established practices. These include keeping fields planted all year round and increasing the variety of plants being grown. Strategies like these can significantly increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil, so agricultural researchers are now building a case for their use in combating climate change. One American investigation into the potential for storing CO2 on agricultural lands is taking place in California. Soil scientist Wendy Silver of the University of California, Berkeley, is conducting a first-of-its-kind study on a large cattle farm in the state. She and her students are testing the effects on carbon storage of the compost that is created from waste, both agricultural, including manure and corn stalks, and waste produced in gardens, such as leaves, branches and lawn trimmings. In Australia, soil ecologist Christine Jones is testing another promising soil enrichment strategy. Jones and 12 farmers are working to build up soil carbon by cultivating grasses that stay green all year round. Like composting, the approach has already been proved experimentally. Jones now hopes to show that it can be applied on working farms and that the resulting carbon capture can be accurately measured. It's hoped in the future that projects such as these will demonstrate the role that farmers and other land managers can play in reducing the harmful effects of greenhouse gases. For example, in countries like the United States, where most farming operations use large applications of fertilizer, changing such long-standing habits will require a change of system. Ratan Lal argues that farmers should receive payment, not just for the corn or beef they produce, but also for the carbon they can store in their soil. Another study being carried out... The variety of different species that live in the world's oceans. The variety... I've been looking at ocean biodiversity. That's the diversity of species that live in the world's oceans. About 20 years ago, biologists developed the idea of what they called biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas which have the greatest mixture of species. So, one example is Madagascar. These hotspots are significant because they allow us to locate key areas for focusing efforts at conservation. Biologists can identify hotspots on land fairly easily, but until recently, very little was known about species distribution and diversity in the oceans, and no one even knew if hotspots existed there. Then a Canadian biologist called Boris Worm did some research in 2005 on data on ocean species that he got from the fishing industry. Worm located five hotspots for large ocean predators, like sharks, and looked at what they had in common. The main thing he'd expected to find was that they had very high concentrations of food. But to his surprise, that was only true for four of the hotspots. The remaining hotspot was quite badly off in that regard. But what he did find was that in all cases, the water at the surface of the ocean had relatively high temperatures, even when it was cool at greater depths. 
So, this seemed to be a factor in supporting a diverse range of these large predators. However, this wasn't enough on its own, because he also found that the water needed to have enough oxygen in it. So these two factors seemed necessary to support the high metabolic rate of these large fish. A couple of years later, in 2007, a researcher called Lisa Balance, who was working in California, also started looking for ocean hotspots, but not for fish. What she was interested in was marine mammals, things like seals. And she found three places in the oceans which were hotspots. And what these had in common was that these hotspots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents. And this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. They've been surveying oceans all over the world, including the Arctic. One thing they found there, which stunned other researchers, was that there were large numbers of species which live below the ice, sometimes under a layer up to 20 metres thick. Some of these species had never been seen before. They've even found species of octopus living in these conditions. And other scientists working on the same project, but researching very different habitats on the ocean floor, have found large numbers of species congregating around volcanoes, attracted to them by the warmth and nutrients there. However, biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. So a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile. And then thirdly, they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far, only 1,500 species have been assessed, but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition, to preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. OK, so does anyone have any questions?